Welcome, Ray. Thank you for joining me. In 1967, you were working for Liberty Records. What was your job then? Head of A&R. How did you go about finding talent in 1967? Because there wasn't the internet for people to upload files. And uh, how did people send you their tapes or contact you to, to, to try and get signed up by a record company? Well, the, the, the first thing was that uh, I figured people should know we're looking for talent. And uh, the prime thing was to maybe take an ad. So I thought I'd take an ad in the New Musical Express, which was a very big paper in those days and still is. What sort of response were you hoping for? Were you looking for artists or writers? Well, the ad uh, asked for artists and composers, um, gen just general talent. From it, we got Bonzo Dog Doodah Band, the Gorilla album came out of that, Jeff Lynn and his band, The Idol Race. Um, then there was Mike Batt and all the things he's done now. Yeah. And uh, of course, famously, there was uh, Elton John and uh, another guy called Bernie Taupin. Why was it that Elton interested you? What was it about him that uh, caught your attention? His voice. He wanted to sing. He wasn't allowed to sing very much in bluesology and uh, he felt frustrated by that. And uh, also, uh, I always remember him sitting there saying, I feel lost and I need something to move on. But there was another thing, I've got to say, that inspired, that, that really I love was the fact that at the Elton John meeting when he came along, he, I asked him, well, if he was a piano player and he was a singer, there's a piano, go and sing some songs. And he got up there and he sang and he was, his voice was great. What was good about Bernie Taupin's lyrics? What made them stand out for you? They were quite novel in, in, in as much that I didn't understand a lot of them. Um, the most important thing was that he had written in his letter that he couldn't write music and he felt that his lyrics could be set to music. And if you think of bands like uh, Proko Harum and that their lyrics, they were all a bit out there, uh, precocious and all the rest of it, but there was something there. And um, that inspired me to uh, introduce them. Elton writes music to Bernie's lyrics. How did they arrive at this way of working? Well, one of the problems was uh, Elton lived in Pinner, Bernie lived in uh, Lincoln. And so having suggested that Bernie send his lyrics to Elton, you know, it, it was really a correspondence course that, you know, really got the ball going. And then um, everything developed from there. And it's always been that way. I mean, that's the way they've continued to write, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, they meet up from time to time. But they did, you know, Bernie did end up staying at Elton's house with his mother, uh, Sheila, and uh, they became chums, really, and uh, they went everywhere together. Tell me about how you ended up managing Elton John. Um, I ended up managing Elton John because uh, I'd been managing... Um, the Idle Race and, and Jeff Lynne, and uh, I was living in a house in Belgravia near a pub called the Duke of Wellington, very nice pub. And uh, there was a knock on the door, and it was Bernie and Elton with, um, and Elton was carrying a shopping bag, looked like Tiny Tim, and uh, he came along and said, uh, I'd like you to be my manager. He said, Dick James has signed me up for everything, and uh, he said that uh, I could buy his management. And I said, well, I haven't got any money to buy your management. Why did you do the deal with Dick James? Because after I had attempted to get money with other partners, such as John French and Brian Morrison, uh, Vic Lewis, Brian Morrison's partner, said to me, do you believe Elton John's going to earn $75,000 a year to make this worthwhile to pay you the money to manage Elton? I said, yes. And he said, you've got to be joking. They laughed me out of the room. Uh, Brian believed in it. And uh, Brian had had meetings with uh, Dick. They didn't get on. And then uh, Dick said to Elton, well, look, why don't you have Ray manage you and I'll do it with him. And Ray takes 10% and uh, I'll take 10%. Did you negotiate Elton's deal with Dick James? 
Well, no, once, uh, first of all, there was a deal to make with Dick James getting my percentage. Right. And what he did was, was to make the um, contract, he, he got a new contract. So the contract was between Elton and Dick James Music, and Ray Williams was the manager, and he got 10%. Of course, I was very naive and all the rest of it. And uh, Dick said, well, I'll, I'll give Ray the facility at the office, and I'll pay him an advance of 40 pounds a week, and uh, Ray will go and promote you and market you and all that stuff. So, and Dick said, I'll take care of all the money, I'll take care of all the publishing, I'll take care of this, and th that was it. And so I went on, and my job purely, really, was to try and get this guy a platform. And my focus was on TV shows in Europe and you know, trying to get stuff going in America and so on and so forth. What did it cost to make an album back in 1968, and how much money did you need? Well, I think the Empty Sky probably went, uh, I can't remember exactly, but about a thousand pounds. I think uh, the Elton John was about two and a half, three thousand, and I think the uh, Tumbleweed Connection album was about three and a half, four, no more than that. What happened with Dick James then? My relationship uh, with Dick James uh, deteriorated very fast. Um, it's very easy to look back, but he took total advantage of me, a young kid. Um, I'd gone uh, to America for the opening of the Troubadour with Elton, and we did some other gigs in different places. And uh, I remember we had a, a few days to kill when we got there. And I said, uh, well, let's go down and uh, meet, some <laughs> meet a friend of mine. She's a lovely girl. And uh, I rang her up and it ended up that we all went down to Palm Springs for a day or a couple of days. And uh, when Bernie met his wife, that, his first wife that way, he'll probably never forgive me for that. But anyway, she was a lady called Maxine. So Elton didn't want to go. You know, I think there was a bit of his, um, his newfound uh, sexuality coming to the surface. And uh, so we went off. I thought nothing of it because we were mates. We were absolute mates. It was that, you know, it was like, well, you do that, I'll do this. And, you know, and off we went, all of us, except for Elton, who stayed at the hotel. And uh, during that night, he, he rang up uh, Dick James and said he'd been left all on his own. And, uh, you know, Dick, what Dick did, which I'll never forgive him for, is that uh, Elton had complained about that. We went on and opened at the Trooper door, and it was unbelievable. You know, he was a star overnight. Dick James could see, very simply, 20% is better than 10%. And... When we got back to England, he called me in his office and he said, uh, I'm going to, uh, with uh, Jeffrey, his business affairs guy, he said, I'm going to tear your agreement up. I said, why? He said, well, I'm just going to tear it up. He said, uh, I'm going to give you 500 pounds. I said, no. And uh, so I got hold of Elton. And we went to lunch and we agreed actually that I had a year on the contract and that he would honour that. And uh, that was fine because we were mates, you know, and I wanted to see, you know, primarily we were mates. So he went off to America to record the live album and Dick James called me in again and I said, you're going to honour the agreement. He said, no, I'm going to tear it up. Um, and so he's, I said, well, I'm not accepting it. I'm going to see uh, Crawley and Dorella. So I went to see Crawley and Dorella. And in those days, it was not ethical for a lawyer to do anything unless it was a fee-paying option. So they wouldn't take a piece of the action on a deal if they believed you were right. I believe in America they might have, that they were doing that sort of thing, taking a residual interest. But in the UK, it was just not ethical for an old firm like Crawley and Dorella to do that. So I went back to uh, Dick James and he said, well, I'm going to increase it. He says, it's a lot of money. 
900 pounds. And I had a six month old daughter called Amarina, who Elton and Bernie named and put on the Tumbleweed Connection album. And uh, I remember going home to my wife then and I said, look, they've offered 900 pounds and we, you know, we, we shouldn't do this, we should go to court. And uh, she was hysterical because Dick James had cut off all the money that was due to me and we had no money whatsoever and we couldn't even buy food for our little baby daughter or for ourselves. We're in the ship. So I tried to play it with Dick James, but he was far too smart. He said, well, I'll give you 1,500 pounds. And my wife then said, take it, take it, take it. We're desperate. And you know, you, you're a young kid and you just, you know, you do stupid things. So I took it and I thought Elton would sort it out later, you know, because he said he would. And then basically that was it. But not only, you know, the 1,500, he deducted all the 40 pounds that I'd had and all the bits and pieces. So there was fuck all left. You couldn't talk to Elton at the time, presumably, and his drugs problems have been well documented. But since then, and since he's cleaned up his act, have you managed to talk to him about this and resolve these issues? I've seen Elton John lots of times at events, and indeed, uh, we had a very, uh, uh, you know, quite a few hours together once in Paris uh, discussing all these issues, um, and I tried to confront them or get him to confront them. <laughs> so, as far as you're concerned, does the issue of what Dick James did remain unresolved or is it resolved? Oh, no, it's certainly not resolved. You know, time is a healer in many ways, but I mean, I still think the matter was dealt with very shabbily. And uh, I think it's, uh, you know, if I can pass on to people uh, not to put themselves in that position, that would be uh, something positive coming out of it. When Elton brought his case against Dick James, you were a witness for him. How did that come about? Well, this is a, another odd thing. The first person they called, um, both sides, by the way, uh, both came to me and asked me if I'd uh, be their witness. And uh, I said to Jeffrey, the uh, guy working for Dick James, who'd previously, who incidentally had worked for Elton as well, and John Reed, and prior to that had worked for Dick. So he was really in the, uh, on both sides of the fence. And um, I told him that if I was to go and talk on behalf of Dick James, you know, as I would with Elton John, I would only tell the truth. And I don't think it would enhance their position. Wow. And with, uh, sorry, and, and with Elton John, I provided uh, to their lawyers, Eversheds, many, many witnesses for his case that helped him win it. Given what happened, why didn't you think of bringing an action against Dick James yourself? Well, I was advised, now here's another area, I was advised that any claim I had was out of jurisdiction. You know, in other words, six, seven years or whatever the uh, statutory period is, that I was outside of that. For someone who initiated one of the most successful songwriting partnerships of the 20th century, you didn't make much money out of introducing Elton and Bernie. Well, I've tried to uh, put it behind me to some extent. Um, you can't put it behind you totally because there's so many people that want to talk about it. So I try and uh, just move on and uh, deal with whatever I'm dealing with uh, you know, at that particular moment uh, without it letting me worry about it too much. Um, you know, it does piss me off from time to time. However, you just got to move on, you know. You were 20 years old when you met Elton. Do you sometimes wish that he had come into your life 10 years later when you had some business experience? Oh yeah, <laughs> easy, yeah.